This is a sculpture garden built in the museum in honor of those international friends who have been contributing to the cause in China to fight against the Japanese aggression during the Second World War. They're coming from all over the world. Many of them are from the United States originally. For example, Mr. Chennault, who is the head of the Flying Tigers pilot, and General Stilwell, who was then pretty much responsible for the Pacific theater of the Second World War. And I'm here waiting for the U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador Max Baucus, to hear his recounts of that part of the history and his personal experiences here in China. These are the people who have been contributing to the cause in the Pacific theater of the Second World War. Right. Many of them are Americans. I'm right. sure you are familiar with some of their faces. Yeah. Mr. Chenault. You can't for forget his face. He has the most distinguished profile. When you look at his profile, <laughs> the jutting jaw, that's Claire Chenault, General Absolutely. Chenault. Absolutely. With the Flying Tigers. With the Flying Tigers. He was amazing. Ever legend, isn't it? Yeah, it is. and he's so amazing. He was so determined. You know, people who succeed tend to be people who are very determined in life, and he was determined to succeed, especially with, with putting the Flying Tigers together. Yes, indeed. And they did something wonderful to help China during the Second World War. And of course, the Chinese didn't forget that. They have not. Um, but you know, I think it's very important for us to help remind people of joint efforts where we, each country helped each other. Mm -hmm. People sometimes forget, and they have to be reminded somewhat frequently. And I'm very happy that, that, that this, um, all these museums are here in Chengdu, mm -hmm. especially honoring those who helped fight the Japanese uh, during World War II. Mm. But we have to be reminded, and General Chenault is, I think, is someone that we have to keep reminding people about all over China, not just in Chengdu. Yes, indeed. And also not only in China, yeah, but also in the in United China. States Absolutely. as well. Yes, indeed. And also General Stilwell. Mm -hmm. Of course, he even used to work in the embassy at the time. Yeah, he's quite a guy. <laughs> he is quite a guy. Much personality, isn't it? Very much. Uh, I read a book about Vinegar Joe. Vinegar oh, Joe Stilwell. Yes, Stilwell. indeed. Vinegar yes, Joe. Indeed. And what's the impression you have about him as a historical figure? Well, he um, was a, one of, the, of the old school. He just, you work hard, uh, you fight for your country, and be of the highest integrity, yes. highest integrity. And you just don't suffer fools gladly. And you just work your very best for your country, and as he did during World War II. He has this wonderful expression, I think it's very important. It is that the higher you climb the flagpole, the more you expose your rear end. Oh, yes, <laughs> That indeed. is, the higher you get up, the more people shoot at you, figuratively, and they give you a hard time. He, the two of them, you know, they, 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 they were, a little tension. They, <laughs> they had like a little bit other, of tension yeah, over they, there. But, yes. they, but they were here for the same cause, the same reason yeah. to deter Japanese. It's aggression. interesting because General Stilwell, he was pretty much for the ground forces yeah. because that's where he came from. Right. And also Mr. Chennault, of course, for the Flying Tigers, right. the Air Forces. And this is the debate that's going on within the United States about how to deal with the Pacific theater of Second World War. Well, I think back in that time, they're both right. Yeah. They're both right. You yeah. just, it, it can't be just one thing or the other. You have to work together. They did work somewhat together, <laughs> but it was a little, there's a bit tense. It's still is. the joint effort work. But in a way, it also <laughs> reflects what's happening right now because there are debates also inside your country, Mr. Ambassador, about how to deal with China. What's the approach? Uh, what do you make of those debates? Well, I think our countries are, are actually working pretty well together. Uh, we both um, are very, the two largest economies in the world. Well, people are the same, the United States and China. We have the same goals, interests, and desires. Mm. Keeping that in mind, I think, is extremely important. Can we keep us. those in mind? We Can have, we? I think we have to, and uh, I think we must, and I think we will. But yeah. it's up to us to keep reminding people of that. Yes. It takes a lot of us um, who's work in China and in the United States to, rec to remind people of that. That's really what I want to ask you, Mr. Ambassador. I mean, you were born almost at the time of the Second World War. Yeah. The great generation you have experienced yeah. in a way. Yeah. And now you are in a very important position as the U.S. Ambassador to China when the world is changing. So how have these gentlemen's experiences and stories in China, and their debates as well, <laughs> can you inspire your work? Well, you answered the question. They're inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> They're very inspiring. That's what they are. Mm. And they're great men. You know, I can't begin to be great like these two, but I could be inspired by them. Mm. And all of us could be inspired by heroes, um, inspired in the right way. That is, heroes who worked to help make the world better. I would do what I can to help Americans, help Chinese understand each other, because the more we understand each other, 
and the more we appreciate each other's efforts to help each other, the more it's going to help this relationship work really well. I understand later you are still going to visit some parts of the museums. Right, yeah. Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to see you in a while. I hope so. All right, so have fun <laughs> Thanks, and baby. let's have this memorable moments. We will do. While the ambassador went to visit some of the museum's collections, I also found this corner. Lines of glass walls featuring handprints collected from more than 5,000 senior-aged Chinese soldiers who fought all their ways against the Japanese aggression during the Second World War. According to Chinese official data, China's civilian and military casualties from 1937 to 1945 alone are 20 million dead and 15 million wounded. But eventually, China got Allied support. Among those Allied forces fighting alongside China, still the most well-known today are the Flying Tigers. It's a team of American pilots recruited under presidential authority and commanded by Claire Ni Chennault. They drove planes with shark-faced nose designs among the most recognizable image of any individual combat unit of World War II. These are the photos from the Flying Tiger planes wreckage. The Flying Tigers are not only well known for their innovative tactical success, but also for their strategic victories during the lowest point of the Second World War for the, both the U.S. and the Allied forces. And their success eventually provided hope for China and the rest of the world that the Pacific theater of the war could be won and the Japanese could be defeated. However, none of this could be possible without airports. And this is what exactly the Chinese did. They used steelies as huge as this to make airport and build one ways almost overnight so that a success can be guaranteed. Decades later, the Chinese still remember that part of history very well. They want to honor those who have devoted their lives to this great cause. 30 volunteers from all over China with their photos over here trekked 15 days through glaciers, mountains, and waters to the 5,000 meter high glacier in Tibet. There, they found not only wreckages of the flying tiger planes, but also even some bones of the flying tiger pilots. In their backpack, they carry all of those things back from the glacier and eventually put all of them into this museum right behind me. There are wreckage of the Flying Tigers recently discovered. It was only possible after three years of preparation and enormous amount of research. That was recognized by Ambassador Balkus, standing in front of the walls with photos of the Flying Tiger heroes. I want to give you this um, letter for all of your work in recovering remains and building these museums uh, to, to, uh, to honor something that's so important so that we will always remember uh, these people who work so much on behalf of us. And more importantly, the uh, strong, strong relationship between the United States and China and how our two companies work together to deter Japanese aggression. We are deeply indebted to you, deeply. <laughs> 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 Ambassador Balkus, it's great to see you. Yeah, thank you. How was it when you look around this museum, refreshing your memories of the Second World War? Frankly, I'm astounded. I'm stunned. Uh, the collection here is, uh, exceeds my expectations. So I, I wish more people in America, more people in China could see it. It's terrific. And you heard about the 30 volunteers who climbed the high mountain glaciers in order to find the wreckages of the planes and also the bones of the pilot. Yeah, it's, a, it's stunning. It's, it's inspirational. I guess some hunters <clears throat> in Tibet first sighted the wreckage and word passed on and it took three years to prepare the expedition to recover the remains and bones and so forth. There may be more up there, I don't know, but, it, 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 that, but recovering those increases the expectation that maybe there's more and, they, and the legend lives on. When China and U.S. together they can really do something great, it seems. Well, we certainly did back in World War II, no question about it, and we certainly can do it again. I think when the chips are down, that is when times get, when, if not a crisis, but where there's a, a real challenge, then people tend to work better together. 
And I think, I hope we don't face a crisis. I hope we don't face a challenge. I don't think we will. But um, it, the knowledge that we have many times worked the United States and China so well together is a good reason to believe we can and we will. There's no question in my mind. And what is in your mind that you think could help us to prevent crisis from happening? I think basically it's important for American people to understand Chinese people just like American people. You know, same wishes, hopes, and desires, and, and Chinese people are the same. It also, I think, it would help if we were to travel more, if Americans would spend more time getting out of America and come over to China to see China and to deflate some of the myths, you know, one way or another about China and vice versa. It's good that so many Chinese uh, come to the United States. We issue about 2.7 million visas a wow. year of Chinese visas coming to America. And I wish more Americans would come over too. But in the meantime, we can publicize these efforts. You know, people watch TV. You know, they look on the internet. And the more we can publicize all of this, and you know, that all helps. But we've been hearing about, you know, the rebalance strategy and there are certain kinds of sentiment in China who do not necessarily understand what is the real nature of this. Are they trying to corner China into a very small place? Uh, are, do they really understand the rise of China? Is there going to be future conflict between China and the United States, a rising power, incumbent power? People ask these generally important questions. Those are good questions. Those are questions that should be asked. And when they're asked, they should be examined very constructively and um, with, with, with deep um, efforts and, and efforts that listen to the other country, to listen to the other country's point of views because China's not perfect, the United States is not perfect. Each country has its own culture, its own pride, um, and its own sense of nationalism, um, but we can't let that get in the way because it's, it's, with each passing day, the world's getting smaller. We're getting closer and closer together. Actions that occur in one country are gonna more likely affect uh, the other country, both ways. And uh, so as I, I think inevitably, when, when people ask that question, um, when people start to think about it, not just knee-jerk, not just react to what somebody else says, but, but think about it, they'll realize that, uh, that we will probably, most, not only probably, highly likely we will get together in a positive way because we have no alternative. Mm. What do you think might be the biggest danger facing the two countries? Is it internal politics? Is it misunderstanding a mistrust toward one another strategically? I think the biggest potential danger is failure of people in both countries to take the time and effort to learn about the other country. And I th it's partly because people tend to be, li be a little bit comfortable. It, it's important for people to get out of their comfort zones. For Americans- Not well, easy. Not easy, it takes work, it takes effort. It's like all things in life, it takes work. Have you tried? I've done my very best every day, try to understand China better, understand better, and to um, explain to Chinese people as well as I can, American point of view, and ask lots of questions of Chinese, the Chinese point of view, so I better understand. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a constant, constant, everyday effort. And Mr. Ambassador, when you were serving on the Capitol Hill, you were very instrumental in making sure China and the United States would be able to work together within the WTO framework. And that, of course, is the trade. It's the foundation, one of those, for the two countries. Is that still going to be the foundation, given the trade conflicts and the different kinds of economic priorities of the two countries? Yeah. Well, um, trade, I think, is the ballast between our two countries. But we have to move beyond trade. WTO was a trade agreement. It lowered uh, tariffs and lowered trade barriers between and among countries. The next step is investment. Uh, United States and China, as I'm sure you know, are working very hard to adopt what's called a bilateral uh, investment treaty. That's investment, and, and that means that, and that's more important in a certain respect because if, if each country can invest um, more freely and easily with more confidence in the other country, they're gonna be more involved in the other country because that's investment. So it's, I hope that we can get that passed. But that's but so difficult, Mr. Ambassador. Things that are, have high value are often difficult. It is important to make the effort. Because we have no choice. We got two choices. Try or do nothing. We make the effort and we work hard at it. And pretty soon things start to happen. Mr. Ambassador, when I met you at the sculpture garden earlier, you told me there are only two places in China that you haven't been to. What are those two places? Well, I've been to every province. Uh, President Xi Jinping asked me what provinces I've not yet been to, and they are Henan and, um, okay. Henan and um, Jiangxi.
Wow, we are looking forward to so your stories after coming back. Big, big story when I reach my last province. <laughs> then I got to go back and do them over again. <laughs> oh, okay. You still have very busy schedule. Oh, yeah, they're always Mr. Ambassador, it's such a pleasure to my have honor. you over here. Thank you. Thank you so much. All and the best. Luck. And good luck. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Judy, how are you? <laughs>